Welcome into the Arc Gibbs Sports Business Podcast. This is episode six. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about the USA Pro Cycling Challenge. And thank you for joining us. There's nothing quite like the mountains of Colorado. I call it the Big Open. And for anyone who's ever driven up the high roads and watched the sunrise, you know what I mean. It is a majestic place. A majestic place to hike, a majestic place to camp, a majestic place for an athletic competition, for a battle to rage between people with their machines racing towards the heavens, whether it's flying up Pike's Peak at 100 plus miles per hour in a custom-made Peugeot, or pedaling with all your might, grasping for air as your bicycle ascends, either way there is a magic to it. The magic of Colorado, and the glory days of past cycling classics. Well, that's what the team that put on the USA Pro Cycling Challenge wanted to harness. And for several years, they did just that. The Coors Classic took place from 1980 to 1988 and had all the lore of 80s cycling culture in America. American phenom and three-time Tour de France winner Greg LeMond won the race twice. And one of the greatest cyclists of all time, Bernard Eno, the Badger, won in his prime. America's team 7-Eleven competed in full force. The Coors Classic was an offshoot of the Red Zinger Classic, originally started by Celeste Tees, Haynes Celeste in the present, in 1975 to sell its Red Zinger tea. I don't normally think of tea as a zinger, but maybe in this case it was. Anyway, there was a race named after it. And after several years of the Red Zinger Classic, the race was purchased by its then PR director, Michael Eisner, for a dollar to consummate the contract. Eisner went out and got Coors, the famed Colorado brewer, to be his title sponsor, and the race name was changed to the Coors Classic in 1980. The race was a big success in the United States and became the fourth largest race in the world, only behind the Tour de France, the Giro d'Italia, and the Vuelta a España. Its merchandise was well sought after and generated a million dollars in sales in 1987 and a million and a half dollar of sales in 1988, a little over two million and three million respectively in today's dollars. That's just the merchandise alone and that helped support the race dramatically. Coursing through the mountains and mountain towns of Colorado, which were usually only brimming with people during ski season, the Coors Classic turned the people out in full force during the summer months. The beautiful ski cities throughout the state, and in later years throughout other states as well, welcomed the riders with their beauty and crowds. So it's with that success as a backdrop in Colorado that the organizers set out to rekindle that spirit in the 2010s. Enter the USA Pro Cycling Challenge. Putting on a new cycling race, especially one in the United States, is certainly not without its challenges. For starters, cycling plays second fiddle to football, basketball, baseball, NASCAR, and arguably golf and tennis in the United States. Even after the days of Lance Armstrong, which helped tremendously cycling in the U.S., cycling was still, well, a sport that cyclists loved. Sitting at the top of the Olympic sports heap, perhaps, but below any major commercialized sport within the U.S. That's not the case in Europe, where generally cycling sits only second to soccer, or football, uh, as they call it over there. Then, an additional challenge with these races, that kind of, quote, tour from city to city, there's the hassle of dealing with several different municipalities, which for the most part all have different requirements pertaining to blocking off roads, how many police officers must be paid by the race organizers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All different from city to city, which makes getting everything lined up as a race promoter on the exact day and the week that it's needed for the flow of the race to go smoothly is, is a real joy for any race organizer, especially since these are generally upfront costs and are usually out of pocket. As far as race development goes, they're so early on. 
those are a couple of challenges. And, and I'll add some more on here to kind of give a vibe for what, what happens with these races. Without going into too much detail, there's insurance, there's booking arrangements, making sure there's enough available hotels and hotel space for the teams, the riders, the staff, the press. Then there's the logistics of moving the finishing area apparatus each day and having chase vehicles throughout the course for filming and aid. These are challenges with any touring race, but it's especially a big feat in the U.S. with this commercial backdrop that's not necessarily the most favorable to you. It makes it a very tough challenge. But it's this challenge that they set out to do, the race organizers. They accepted this challenge gladly as the prize would be large enough. A successful race in Colorado, a successful race in the U.S., showing the glory of the United States in these mountains and cycling towns to the rest of the world. Certainly would not be without its challenges, but that's what the team set out to do when they created the USA Pro Cycling Challenge. Enter the challenge. On August 4th, 2010, the race was officially announced with Governor Bill Ritter and Lance Armstrong present for the announcement. The name of the race would be the Quiznos Pro Cycling Challenge. Rick Shaden, the money behind the race in this start, gained his wealth from the Quiznos brand. Rick Shaden and his father, Richard Shaden, who was an aviation attorney, took advantage of an early franchising opportunities being offered by Quiznos. They opened their first Quiznos restaurant in 1987. At that time, only 12 other Quiznos franchises were operating throughout the United States. Seeing success in this business, they opened three more Quiznos over the next four years, then purchased a block of 18 restaurants from the parent company themselves, and this purchase effectively gave them control over the Quiznos company. Upon purchase, Rick became the president of Quiznos and then CEO of Quiznos. In 1994, he took the company public at the tender age of 30. Wow. By 1995, the Quiznos restaurant count was up to 103 restaurants. Shaden had expanded marketing efforts, had expanded bulk purchasing and vendor selection, and had greatly enhanced the training processes used by the company. The 103 restaurants was an impressive number, especially for a 31-year-old CEO, but that number would be dwarfed by their eventual 5,000 restaurant zenith in 2007. On February 4, 2011, Rick Shaden, co-founder of Quiznos and co-chairman of the event, formally announced the initial $10 million investment to get the event started. And they were off. As the race was taking shape and the television contracts were coming into color, it was decided that although Quiznos would remain a major sponsor, the race would be renamed the USA Pro Cycling Challenge to garner more and more global branding for the race. The TV deals we're speaking of, well, they would consist of one day of the race on NBC as Comcast, which owned Versus at the time and was the channel that the Tour de France was broadcast on in the United States, had just purchased NBC, making that a possibility for them to have that one day on NBC, which was a big coup. According to the Sports Business Journal, the Versus deal did not come with a fee paid to the USA Pro Cycling Challenge. But race director Sean Hunter did negotiate a mid-six-figure deal for the international broadcast rights of the race. All in all, they'd have 25 hours of TV coverage for the race, which was fantastic. Additionally, and importantly, given the Tour de France's place in the sport, Phil Liggett and Paul Sherwin, the voices of the Tour de France, who would also be doing the announcing for the Pro Cycling Challenge, along with Bob Roll, just a little over a month after the Tour de France, would plug the race during the Tour throughout the stages that year. That would be a big boon for the USA Pro Cycling Challenge in its initial year. So, they were off. The first race was to take place August 22nd through 28th, 2011. featured a star-studded field, not only many of the top American cyclists, but also the top three finishers from the Tour de France that year. Wow, Cadell Evans, Andy Schleck, and his older brother, Frank Schleck. That's quite the family. I mean, me and my brother played street hockey in the driveway growing up, but we weren't. Anyway, the race began with an eight-kilometer time trial in Colorado Springs, the home of U.S. Olympic Development and his main training facilities. 
The stage was won by German time trialing specialist and former junior world champion in that discipline, Patrick Gretzk. The following two stages were mountain stages, coursing through the beautiful and majestic mountains of Colorado. Stage one finished in the mountain town of Crested Butte and was won by American Levi Leipheimer, a dominant continental rider and a Tour de France podium finisher in his own right. Stage two saw the riders go over the two highest passes in the race, and really two of the highest passes of any bike race in the world, Cottonwood Pass and Independence Pass. This was perhaps the queen stage, the largest and toughest of the race, and it was won out of a small finishing group by Captain America, George Hincapi. Can we call him Captain America? Well, anyway, it was won by Big George Hincapi. I know we can call him that. That was his nickname, the brilliant and powerful classics writer who stewarded Lance through seven Tour de France victories and married a French podium presenter, podium model, which was a big no-no at the time, but George got it done. Stage three was a steep uphill time trial with almost 1,800 feet of altitude gain and a short 10-mile time trial. The route for the race was to harken back to the Coors Classic of the 1980s. It was the same stage and climb used in races of the day. And let's just admit, there's not much better than a punchy uphill time trial. Levi Leipheimer won the stage narrowly over Christian Vandeveld, and Rafael Infantino of Colombia, another high-altitude region of the world. Leipheimer put significant time into the rest of the field and set a new course record for this lauded course of 25 minutes and 47 seconds. Consolidating his overall lead, a lead he would defend over the final three stages into the race's finish in Denver. Americans wound up sweeping the podium that year, Christian Vandeveld of Garmin Cervelo in second, and young T.J. Van Gardren in third. It was a strong success on the road, with these top-level pros battling it out. Although, as far as world-class, top-top-tier world-class riders go, it was mainly the American riders who showed up in top form. But even so, the quality of competition was indeed very high, especially for a first-year race. And although the success on the road would remain high, with many of the U.S.'s top pros targeting the race, in many cases second only to the Tour de France as far as their preparation, the financial side showed and would show throughout the coming seasons some of its cracks. The TV viewership was also pretty good that year. As I mentioned before, the race was covered on Versus and NBC Sports Network, as well as some international stations that did pay this mid-six-figure fee for the content. Overall, the race garnered just over a million viewers worldwide, a good number, but generally not enough to garner a USA TV fee as something that like the NFL or the NBA would, would garner. Just to show some contrast to these million viewers, to compare it to the king, the NFL, which again, any, any TV numbers in the U.S. would really be dwarfed as far as sports go. But anyway, the King, the NFL, averaged right around 16.5 million viewers per regular season game. And that deal, we know, is worth roughly $180 million per team, or a whopping $5.7 billion overall. The USA Pro Cycling Challenge would continue on for four more years each year doing a little better in the financial column than the year before. According to the Sports Business Journal, by 2013, the sponsorship revenue was right around $7 million for the race. The budget remained unchanged for the 2014 race, and if the statements by leadership are correct, that puts the cost to run the race right around $10 million per year, or moving towards $2 to $3 million loss, narrowing from that initial $10 million loss and investment in the first year. But even so, with this narrowing, the Shadens had sunk $20 million of their own money into the race. And perhaps that, combined with the timing of some developments at Quiznos, they decided to call it quits and end financial support of the USA Pro Cycling Challenge in 2016. Following the Shadens' exit, Sean Hunter, the race director, took over the ownership group as well as the CEO and director roles that he, that he previously had with the race. 
Hunter speculated in a Denver Post interview that potentially the Shadens' unrelated business dealings and lawsuits had scared away some potential long-term sponsors throughout the race's time, making the race sort of less profitable throughout its years and, and then consequently costing the Shadens more money and, and making the race happen. So I'll talk briefly just kind of regarding that. I won't go into too much detail here, but here we go. Quiznos in 2009 had settled a class action lawsuit with franchisees for $95 million. The franchisees had claimed that the company overcharged for supplies that were purchased and kind of failed to provide adequate marketing support. And then following a 2012 restructuring and eventual seeding of control of Quiznos by the Shadens to the new controlling owners, Fortress Capital and Avenue Capital, those capital groups filed a lawsuit against the Shadens, alleging that the numbers uh, that were depicted to them were not accurate. And then in 2014, the Quiznos company, under these new owners, uh, eventually did file for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. So there you go. I mean, who who knows if that really did drive big name sponsors away or not for the long term investment? It's something that Hunter mentioned, you know, as he took over both the leadership and the ownership roles. But again, the initial investment was made by the Shadens in the first year and in the early years, and no doubt there wouldn't have been much of a race to be dealing with if not for the Shadens' investment. And of course, as history would have it, the race would not be able to continue on without the financial backing of the Shadens. Evidence that they were really a driving financial force behind the race for for years, and a major reason for the race continuing as long as it did. This leaves the obvious question of what is needed to make a successful cycling race in America, short of the, quote, wealthy benefactor strategy. Is there a structure that would allow all these talented athletes and hardworking people in beautiful landscapes to prevail and work for years and years? That's a big question, and that's a fascinating question, and it's one that we'll dive into in more detail in future episodes. But there you have it. That's a brief story of the USA Pro Cycling Challenge in Colorado. And thank you for listening. Again, we appreciate all the support. Uh, Please like, subscribe, five stars, tell your friends about us if you can. We would love that. Uh, Don't don't hesitate to reach out. You can leave a comment, leave a thought, and we'll kind of look to the listeners as far as guidance of what kind of topics and things that maybe some details or some stories that we've touched on that maybe you'd like to hear more about in the future, or kind of a deep dive on. Please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, you can go to our website or you can again comment or message on the the podcast. Uh, we appreciate it. We appreciate it. And we'll, we'll talk to you next time. Thank you very much for listening and everyone stay well out there. Thank you so much.